story of the Passion Week, and it's going to be led by Dick Howard, uh, and really just be a beautiful time set aside early morning and in the evening. So I think we're looking at 6 a.m. and 7 p.m. every day during Holy Week, Monday through Saturday, to um, to enter into some of the scripture and the story and kind of immerse ourselves in that reality and then have some space to kind of contemplate that in the context of Holy Week. So more on that to come. Good Friday service will be that Friday of Holy Week uh, in the evening, and then we will have regular hours for our services on Easter, but we're going to have a feaster um, as well. I, I think that's what we're going to call it. I'm just I'm just saying it now. It's going to be feaster. Um, we're going to do Easter, and then we're going to do feaster upstairs, uh, 1 p.m., and we're just going to eat. So it's bring your best food. We're going to throw a big party, uh, and we're going to celebrate the resurrection together as a community, and you're welcome to bring your friends and family. And so more details on that to come too. But if you're planning and making your plans, we'd love for you to consider um, being uh, with your church family for a feast on that Sunday. That's all I have. Thank you for listening to all of that. More details on much of that to come. We're going to give our offering. I'd love to pray for our offering. If you're new, no obligation to give this morning. This is a way that um, those who call this place home uh, kind of align ourselves with the values of, of Jesus and his kingdom and worship in this way. So... Would you pray with me? God, even as we declared together with one voice this morning your your love for us in sending Jesus to, to ransom and reconcile us to you, God, your generosity knows no bounds, and you are you are a God that gives and gives and gives and um, as we sit in that love and receptive of uh, of that generosity this morning we long to be your people in this place that your light would come in and through our generosity in the way that we live and give to each other to our families to our friends to our co-workers um, God that you might be reflected that your generosity might be reflected in our generosity and that you might be worshipped and praised in what we give here and what we give elsewhere as well. God, we thank you and we honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, you're in for a real treat this morning. Uh, Ken uh, Weitzma is uh, joining us. Ken uh, is a f- friend for me that goes back um, way into like family friend zone. I think I met Ken when I was in junior high, and my dad was the family ministries pastor in LA, and uh, hired Ken to come and be the college ministry pastor um, uh, at at the church we were at, which shows you the age discrepancy and how much older Ken is than me. I never got to be in his college ministry because we we moved before before I reached college, but. Uh, uh, just the family history uh, goes a long ways back, but then uh, as um, I've grown, as we've grown into different ministries and different spaces, we've continued to stay uh, connected to each other. Um, uh, Ken, I would say, is a consummate teacher, and you're, gonna, you're going to experience that this morning, um, that uh, his his quest for knowledge and understanding uh, drives him into into um, places where he just seeks to understand and then be able to teach from that space. And uh, he's the type of teacher that you could kind of sit and listen to for a long time. And I had that sense this morning. I don't know if you came in, you saw that we ran that first service uh, rather long. It's because we just want to just sit here and continue to listen. So um, my encouragement to you around this topic this morning is to take a posture of learning. It's difficult and, and hard conversations to have, but for us to be, uh, as Jesus' followers, be, be people who are learners this morning. And I think Ken does a great job of presenting in a way to encourage that, and you're, you're in for a treat. 
Um, Ken wrote a book called The Myth of Equality, which is kind of the title of, of his message this morning. Uh, that book was recognized by Publishers Weekly as a, with a starred review, and then as well was, was ranked in the top five books in religion and spirituality for uh, this last year, along with like a Buddhist book and an atheistic book and um, really competitive um, kind of space. I tell you that not just to brag about the fact that we have a an accomplished author with us this morning, but to say uh, it's it's a recognized book because it's a good book, um, and I would encourage you to read it. It's a really helpful book, I think, as we as uh, a church, a church locally and big C, uh, look at engaging uh, this topic. So. Um, that book is available. Ken brought some books along. If you haven't grabbed one or read one, you can do that um, out in the lobby today, as well as one of his previous books called Create Versus Copy. And they're kind of at just a basic Amazon price. And so if you're wanting to snag one of those um, today, I'd encourage you to do that. Um, I think that's all I have by way of introduction, though. And I just want to give the rest of the time to Ken. So would you welcome with me Ken Weitzma? Thanks, man. Well, good morning. Um, I, uh, I'm actually just a pastor, so um, author is something that's happened to me a bit. Teacher is kind of maybe personality, but, but my heartbeat is I'm just a local church pastor. Um, I'm between churches. Uh, I planted a church in Bend, Oregon 12 years ago called Antioch, uh, and we felt called out of that just recently here, um, and we're moving to Beaverton. Um, so we're moving out of Bend into Beaverton. It's never happened before. It's always the other way. Um, but, uh, but so we start in two weeks kind of at, at our new church, our new home there at Village uh, in Beaverton. And so, um, but that's kind of our, our family's life is, is life is ministry and ministry is life. And it's because we just love this thing called the local church and what we think God does with the local church and bringing us together in Christ and helping us to grow and to know the joy that, that he has for us. And um, that's kind of one of the things I love Adam just because he's a really likable guy. Um, likable people are the people that you're around and you like them and somehow you also like yourself better when you're around them. Um, and Adam's got that gift, um, but he's also the good kind of pastor. I'm, because I love the local church, I'm a bit protective um, because there are bad pastors out there. Uh, C.S. Lewis said, of all bad people, religious bad people are the worst. Um, I've known that to be true. Uh, I think most of us have known that to be true. So I kind of um, look at people, and, and I love when I see a pastor who doesn't love the church because they're a pastor, but they're a pastor because they, they started with a love for the church. Does that make sense? It's really different in how it comes out. So um, it's fun just to be uh, a friend of Adam's and then to be able to come and collaborate with you all this morning. So um, I'm married, my wife Tamara, and four girls. Um, are somewhere out there um, in exploring the greater Portland area uh, and trying to wrap our minds around what it means to, to call this place home. Um, I, I gave them a couple pointers. Uh, I said, as you drive around, just remember it's always sunny um, and the people are very normal. Um, so I'm just kidding. Uh, hey, we're going to dive in uh, to... A, a, an interesting, difficult, challenging topic, but it's also one that the church doesn't really grapple with. We, we have this thing in the church, and I'm guilty of it as a pastor, where when, when conversations are really awkward or, or difficult or maybe um, challenging, we tend to avoid them, and we, we camp on the ones that are a little bit easier, simple, more straightforward. And over time, because we know that, that you, give a, you give anything a long amount of time, whatever those subtle biases are, they get really deeply ingrained or grooved in, right? And so what that means is we don't know how to talk about the really um, difficult conversations that we we're probably struggling with. And we know... Uh, really well how to talk about the conversations that we we find easy and natural and um, maybe aren't struggling with as much, right? Which, which seems backwards, doesn't it? Um, if you go to a Q&A, you learn how quickly we're, we got it backwards because all the questions will come from this camp. 
Um, and, and I can prove to you how guilty I am at this by, by simply the question that I asked myself this morning um, that I'm going to have to go think about um, afterwards. I ask myself questions sometimes when I'm preaching that I don't think about ahead of time, just to be Ill <laughs> illustrative or, or to make a point. And then I realize, ouch, um, that seems problematic. Um, and so I kind of out of nowhere grab this thing like, just ask me how many times I've talked about sex um, from the pulpit. And the answer is zero in 20 years of ministry. So I'm going to have to go think about that. But that kind of proves my point that some of these things, we just it's just not comfortable, so we don't do it. Race and privilege is, is one of those conversations that we've kind of avoided historically for a, a long time, and we've done it to our own peril. Uh, I was reading an article this morning that came out just recently, this last week in the New York Times. It's causing quite a stir, but it was, it's called the, uh, the Silent Exodus, and it's about how African-American Christians are leaving white evangelical churches um, steadily and in large numbers. And so all of the diversity work of the last 30 years to be more integrated. Uh, 11 a.m., it, you know, it's been said is the most segregated hour in America, and, and we've talked about it. We've done conferences on it. People have gotten masters and, and doctorates in this subject. A lot of money's been put at it, grants, and a lot of the integration that's happened in the last 30 years is starting to unravel um, since the election. And what it's basically... Uh, it, in this article kind of coming down to is <clears throat> that that white evangelical, predominantly white evangelical churches have, have wanted diversity and taken a posture of, we'd love for you to be at our table. But they never really listened or understood or got to the point of, of, of connecting with the experience of the minorities in their midst. And so when you go through a trauma that that minorities would feel like is a trauma like this last year with so much of it having racial language around it. And all of a sudden they feel like that conversation not only isn't understood at the table, but it's not, it's not being talked about at the table. Um, when we pray for things, we're not bringing those prayers to the front. When we're really leaning into the mess of it, it's usually kind of a side angle on it that feels safe or comfortable. And so these people are beginning to go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to find a new table because this no longer feels safe. So as a church, we have to, 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 to sense that, to see that, to look at that and go, something's wrong. Or certainly, we, we need to lean into that conversation enough to try to understand what's really happening. Because to say we don't care would seem completely at odds with Jesus' vision for the church, right? I mean, can we, can we agree on that? Um, so we're going to dive into this topic and try and unpack it. And uh, just so you know, I'm conservative. Everything that has shaped my thinking is just saying, um, like Luther, that scripture matters and right reason matters. So Martin Luther, when he was being asked to recant his writings in this kind of um, the Diet of Worms, this famous kind of Reformation history moment, he stands there and gives his address and he says, unless I can be shown from scripture, and, and this part gets missed, or right reason, then I cannot recant, I will not recant, because to do so would go against conscience. Um, and so scripture and right reason, um, truth, really, is, is really what should be guiding us as uh, Christians to try and seek out what God would have for us. So I want to just set the context a little bit by showing some um, pictures of Westminster Abbey. So this is the inside of Westminster Abbey. I took my daughter there uh, this past year, and uh, I think it was May, May June-ish, for uh, a rites of passage trip for her. Um, I got lucky. I had a consulting thing in England, so, you know, travel was paid for, and I got to take my number uh, three daughter. So we have four daughters, 16, 14, 12, and nine. So this was my 12-year-old. We take all of them on a rites of passage trip when they're 12 to kind of say, listen, uh, we, we love you. This is what we affirm in you, what we see in you, and we're now... Issuing, issuing you into a adult in training category where we're going to converse with you about things and get your opinion and your take, but you're going to have to be responsible from here on out because that's this kind of biblical model that there's an age of accountability where you're really under your parents and then around age 12, 13, uh, that's what bar mitzvah is, uh, bar 
Um, in Hebrew means son. And so like Barnabas, son of encouragement, bar mitzvah, son of the commands or the law. So you're moving from being under, say, your parent to being under God and the commands that he's issued forward and responsible before God that way. And it's a beautiful thing to, to, to let your, your kid begin to own their life and the consequences of their, their life and you come alongside them rather than them getting to their teen years and feeling like they're trapped under you, and they're rebelling against that, right? Uh, which was my experience. I think I started that at age eight, though. Um, but, uh, but so we're here, and I took my daughter to Westminster Abbey, and um, we snuck in because it was closed and it was full uh, with a organ concert going on. And um, I'm one of those unique people that think rules are, are just mere suggestions or guidelines. My wife and I are still having a uh, a protracted conversation about this, but so we made it into the, I just ruined everything I'm going to say from here on out. I, I retract what I said. I think there was still room for a couple more people. Uh, we made it into the back, and I took this picture kind of aiming up, up, um, back one, one, still inside, like aiming my camera up so you could see the high ceilings and the light coming in, but there was this organ concert going on that was unbelievable. And as my daughter sat cross-legged on Sir Winston Churchill's grave marker, right five feet inside the door of Westminster Abbey, we watched um, kind of and listened to this thing. Uh, and then I was told to put my camera away uh, right after this picture, because that's, that's forbidden too. Um, <laughs> But so you can see in here the high ceilings, and this is the, the Gothic architecture that's so famous, the high ceilings and all of the natural light. In the Middle Ages, low ceilings, not much light, lots of candles, um, and it was this kind of dark brooding kind of feel. This Gothic architecture really speaks to the transcendence of God. It, it lifts your eye up, it opens you up, and this idea of the transcendence of God, that's just a fancy word for like the otherness of God, right? Just the, the bigness of God that's out there, um, which is opposed to the imminence of God, which is the down-to-earthness of God, the, the nearness of God, the presence of God. And so you, you get this transcendent um, kind of experience of the imminence of God. And that's made possible. So walked around on the outside and was teaching my daughter um, about the architecture. I love just uh, Deuteronomy 6. Um, it, was, it was Adam's dad, Luke Kenricks, that first kind of taught me about Deuteronomy 6 and this idea that, that when we teach our kids about the things of God from the rising of the sun to the setting of the sun, that discipleship of our kids really is just grabbing what's ever around and, and just theologizing it, you know? Um, this is a flying buttress, and this is what it does to the architecture, and this is what it does to the building, and this is what that building then says. And they, the people that did this, put lots of money into it that some people might get upset about today, but they were doing it because as a, a community or a country or a, you know, kind of a Christian nation, if you will, at that time, were saying that we're bringing our best to, to, to create something beautiful that that forces us or draws us into worship, that, that somehow our architecture um, allows us to, to say something about God that's true. And so, you know, you're, you know, you're theologizing. What about your schoolwork? What about your art and your violin playing? And when you're doing that and putting your best into it, what, what about that says something about the beauty of God and the glory of God, right? That's, that's bringing, at least for me, trying to help bring my daughter into a Christian way of seeing the world. But these flying buttresses hold up those walls. There's no I-beams. There's no steel. There's no all that kind of thing. These are the things that allow for that, that large inner space in that, um, in that chapel. Another, another way of looking at it is Notre Dame. These are some of the most famous flying buttresses that just come and just, just jump out, right? And then hold that building in place so that it doesn't fall. And it allows for that tall ceiling and, and that imminence of God, if you will, the transcendence to kind of be what we're doing. So that was what I was thinking about when I was in there listening to that organ. I have a video clip of the sound 
Um, but uh, but some technical problems there. Um, so I was joking in the first service that Adam was going to hum it for you guys, and you, it actually wouldn't be the same though. Um, but just think of that music and that lifting of your soul kind of upward. And then we walked out of Westminster Abbey through the same doors. So we can go to the next slide. Through the same doors that uh, when I was a kid, uh, Charles and Diana walked through when, when they got married. Recently, William and Kate walked through when they got married. Uh, Queen Elizabeth uh, walked through 500 years ago when she was crowned. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Somebody gets my dry humor. Um, I think it was the 50s, maybe. Uh, but but uh, walked through when she was coronated. And so we walked through those famous um, kind of doors. And so I'm like taking it all in. I love history. And I turned around and looked up. And there's these statues. Now, this is the all throughout Europe in the cathedrals. You'll see this kind of statue. Uh, the, the way they're lifted up. In fact, the David was originally being sculpted to be put on the Duomo in Florence. And so that you, you get that kind of pedestal idea and the visual is supposed to be looking up and at an angle. And so the, the artists always kind of do it a certain way. But this one was different because I kind of recognized the face where I felt like I did. And I was like, that something, something doesn't seem the way it normally seems when you're walking around Germany or Italy. And so I kind of leaned in a little closer and sure enough, the second one, um, if you can see it on the pedestal, says king. And I thought, it's still, I mean, really? Like, I thought it was Martin Luther King Jr. Now I kind of think it must be because it says king, but that seems really out of place in England on a cathedral, a Catholic cathedral. And so I, I looked at the other ones, and then I was really shocked, and I was like, what's going on here? So I went and found the placard. You know, at any good historical site, you know you can just go find the placard that explains it to you. And if that doesn't work, um, you can go to the authoritative source on, on all things, Wikipedia. Um, and so I looked it up, and so sure enough, this is a, um, this is a, a wall of martyrs. And so there's a female... Um, Catholic, I think from um, either South America or Africa, I can't remember, uh, that did a lot with the poor, kind of like a Mother Teresa, um, and she's memorialized there. Uh, I'm not sure about her, so forgive me if I get that wrong. And then next to her is Martin Luther Jr., uh, King Jr. And then next to him uh, is a, a Catholic priest from El Salvador that was really a father of liberation theology that was gunned down uh, after uh, serving mass because he was fighting against government corruption. If you don't know it, uh, El Salvador is one of the most interesting countries. All of the land is owned by like uh, uh, roughly seven families. Can you imagine if, if seven families owned all of the land in America and there was just no way to really elbow in on that and, and get yourself somewhere where you could root your family and begin to through the generations. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a crazy thing. And so you have a lot of government corruption uh, and, and he was pushing back on that corruption and was gunned down. And so Oscar Romero is there and it shows him holding a child and again, just the saintly pose. Next to him, um, maybe even, even crazier, uh, you have a German uh, theologian pastor. Anyone want, want to take a guess who that is? It's Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, who was hung at the Flossenburg uh, prison camp just a week before that camp was liberated on orders of Hitler um, because of his complicity in, in, with one of the groups that tried one of the assassination attempts on Hitler. And so you have Dietrich Bonhoeffer there, and this is the wall of Christian martyrs. Um, and we can just go to, there's some other statues, but the statues that ring it are truth and justice. And then if you go to the other one, it's mercy. And I don't know what the other one says. Peace. Um, thank you. And um, so you have this, this kind of on the front of Westminster Abbey, this interesting thing about these martyrs who were all engaged with the on the ground stuff. 
the imminence stuff, the, 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 the stuff that gets you dirty, the same dirt that God used to make us as humans. And that for that work, these people were killed or martyred. And, and then it kind of shows that these are the hallmark virtues of the church, truth and justice, mercy and peace, that these are a part of the character of God. Interestingly, we don't always talk about these aspects of God's character meaning that you can't talk about God without understanding these parts of his character. They're essential parts of his character. We understand that about God's holiness. We understand that about God's love. I mean, imagine with me if I said, we're going to do a Bible study. Uh, it's going to be a great Bible study. And we're going to study God and see what we can learn about God. But, but just to add a, a unique little twist and keep it fun, because, you know, we've been studying God for a long time. Uh, we're going to take the holiness of God and strip it out, set it outside of the room. We can't make reference to God's holiness at all. It's going to be distracting. We're going to study the rest of God and see what we could learn. Like, it would be nonsensical. Like, if we were to say, okay, we're going we're to study God, but we're going to shove love outside the room, it clouds the subject. We're going to leave that off. We can't make any reference to God's love, but we're going to see what we can learn about God. Um, you'd look at me and be like, you're not only making not, not going to come to your Bible study, but you're, you're a heretic and weird all at the same time, right? We, we, the same thing is true of God's peace or, or commitment to peace, desire for shalom and, and flourishing, um, truth and justice and mercy. That's why Jesus looked at the Pharisees and says, you guys have parsed out all of these things, yet you've neglected the weightier matters of the law that really express God's heart because that's a fundamental part of God's character. So this the kind of earthy things that connect us with, with justice and injustice and, and peace and the lack of peace, the brokenness we see, and the mercy that we should have for sinners or bent people rather than the judgment that comes so easy. You know, people have rocks um, in their hands metaphorically before they ever have them in their hands literally. The, the, the people that had rocks in their hands when they were going to stone that women, that, that was just the end of a long process. Before they picked up those rocks, they had the rocks already in their hands metaphorically. And so we go, I don't have a rock in my hand to stone that woman. But the question is, do you have a rock in your heart with regard to people that you are like, man, I just can't handle that sin or that brokenness or that messy thing that just really offends my sense? Do you have a heart uh, that, that, that has already got rocks ready to be picked up? Or do you have a heart of mercy that says, I am the chief of all sinners. Jesus died for me. And he desires that if he showed me such forgiveness, that I would pass that forgiveness along. The parable of, of the one who was forgiven, remember, by the king, the great debt. And then he went and grabbed the guy that owes him two bucks. And he's like yelling at him, I want my two bucks. Um, there was a John Cusack movie back when I was a kid, like that some people in here, I want my $2. And Jesus forgave me for the things that I do. And I've done some bad things. Yet it's a temptation for me to walk around just ready to grab the rocks. These are fundamental aspects of God's character that should shape the way I think. It was interesting. Um, I then went and walked to the street and it connected all of it for me. It had nothing to do with Westminster Abbey, but they had done a procession for Queen Elizabeth on her Jubilee anniversary of her monarchy. And they had commemorated it by putting these Jubilee plaques like in the, in the sidewalk and they renamed the park Jubilee Park and things like that. But it, what I think God was saying to me in my heart just all of a sudden came clear. I walked from this place of transcendence and the imminence of God to being reminded of the martyrs that somehow take God's character and his values and, and live it out and bring it down to earth in a way that is, is going to cause them to suffer, maybe even die. And that that is a beautiful picture of what's really going on in this thing called Jubilee. So Jubilee is a biblical concept. Here we get it from Leviticus, so I'll read it for you. Leviticus 25, 10. I'm going to read most of the passages of Scripture. Some of them will be on the board, um, and you can write them down and, and reference them later if you want to. But Leviticus 25, 10. God says, consecrate the 50th year. So basically one full generation, every full generation. Consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. 
It shall be a jubilee for you. Each of you is to return to your family property and to your own clan. Um, in other words, um, slaves are going to be set free. If you got into bad debt or calamity fell upon you and, and some reason you had to give up family lands or ancestral lands, that you, you have a way of being forgiven and that you can come back and be reestablished the way it ought to be, the way God's heart for it would be. And, and that this is kind of this year of freedom that whatever has been broken, you can kind of reset it. It's, it's a jubilee year. It's a celebration year. It's, it's where the weak can kind of come back up and find some parity with the strong and the community gets to look at each other and go, we we together are experiencing the flourishing of this land and of this community. Um, the Jubilee gets its name from the ram's horn because the Jubilee begins on that 50th year when the ram's horn is blown on the Day of Atonement. That sounds like a lot. It's actually not much. Every year there's a Day of Atonement. The priest blows the ram's horn and it proclaims forgiveness for God's people. God, who has the right to forgive us, forgives us on the Day of Atonement and it's symbolized by this ram's horn being blown. Okay? Why that? God provided the ram in the thicket for Abraham, Isaac. It's this, you know, this symbolism throughout Scripture. So the word jubilee is just simply taken from uh, the Hebrew of ram or this ram's horn. Okay? So now let me put it all together. God, when he's forgiving us spiritually for our sins, transcendence, spiritual, dealing with sin that we like to kind of always focus on more than the social systems, structures, power, oppression. God, when he's talking about forgiveness, extends that out to society and says, in my forgiving of you and resetting things that way, cleansing, there's also this heart I have for the systems and the structures within society, your, your horizontal relationships, to be reset, reconciled, redeemed, and to go back to the way they ought to be as well, so that there's flourishing all the way down and through and out. Because I am the creator, not just of you individually, but also of, of them, us, corporately, and of the rest of creation. Um, I need to be better at environmental ethics. I'm not the best at environmental ethics. I blame it on my four daughters. Um, every time I take out the trash, it's these four daughters you gave me, God. Um, and if that doesn't work, I say, it's the wife you gave me, God. Um, because that works. Um, you can't try humor. Try humor is, is, is shorthand for not funny at all, but I can't um, accept the fact that I'm not funny. Um, so I blame it on you guys. You guys don't give try humor. Uh, I'm just, I'll just keep blaming. Um, no, but, but um, the interesting thing about environmental ethics that has always stuck with me is that our, we have a flawed theology. We have a propensity to talk about creation as if it's nature, right? Creation is nature. Um, I am not a part of nature. I am a human being made in the image of God. I'm outside of that nature, which is creation. Does that make sense? Okay. On um, what day of the week were we created? Sixth day. We were created along with days one through five on the sixth day as a part of creation. And when God was done creating us as a part of his creating the world, he then rested. We, as humans made in God's image, are a part of creation. We can't draw this artificial line and say, that's that, and it has nothing to do with us. We are, are in it. Does that make sense? Um, so here's this beautiful thing of God saying, I want to bring it all together. When I talk about forgiveness and spiritual things, I also want to talk about earthly social things. That's why it's fascinating when you come to Jesus and you look at the parable of the Good Samaritan, which is obviously about neighbor love and all this kind of social stuff. But it was a parable he gave in response to a question about how do I know that I'm saved or, or how do I know that I'm going to heaven or getting it right? In fact, most of the times when Jesus is asked a question about salvation, he answers with an ethical parable. 
Same thing in Matthew 25, the parable of, of whatever you do for the least of these, you do it unto me, right? So come and enter my rest in the joy of heaven because you, you fed me when I was hungry, you clothed me when I was naked, you visited me in, in prison when I was in prison. And they're like, when, when did we do that, Lord? And he says, whatever you did for one of the, the least of these, you did to me. So now enter heaven, right? Then he goes to the goats, that's the sheep. Now the goats, I'm sending you to eternal torment, hell. I'm sending you to hell. What do you mean you're sending us to hell? How are you sending us to hell? Well, because when I was in, in prison, you didn't visit, visit me. When I was naked, you didn't clothe me. When I was hungry, you didn't feed me. It's a really interesting thing that for Jesus, the spiritual, transcendent, kind of ethereal, individual part of our relationship here necessarily connects this way out and vice versa. But we are always wanting to create a, a false dichotomy and to keep those two things separate. My personal piety or righteousness with God is of fundamental importance. And this stuff with other people in society or social justice, Justice or whatever, that's secondary or tertiary at best. That's just good works. It's irrelevant to, to the weightier things, my own individual salvation. That's our false dichotomy. That's not the text. That's not Jesus. Okay? So I want to make an argument here and say this conversation about race and privilege belongs in the church, belongs in our Christian conversations. And I'm going to give you five reasons. I'm going to go through them pretty quick. And the first one is this. It belongs um, in, in our conversations because um, race belongs in our gospel conversation. It's a part of the gospel. How can you say to me that the gospel is good news if it doesn't have something to say to the greatest historic injustice of the last 500 years? How, how can we understand Jesus when Jesus came proclaiming the kingdom of God and took great pains to always connect it to the Samaritan, to um, the sinner, to the leper, to the tax collector, to the woman, to all of these edges of society that always got left out of, of the conversation about what God was doing with his people. And Jesus comes to talk about the kingdom and is always stretching it to the edge, even talking about our prayer for our enemies because they are not outside of God's plan. Pray them in. Um, every enemy that you see is a potential future friend. That's how we're supposed to see it. Um, the gospel is a light. Uh, Jesus is the light of the world. Uh, don't hide your light under a bushel. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. It's the nature of light um, to touch every corner of the room. If we made this room dark and I lit something here, however faint, that light would flicker and send out light that would touch every corner of this room. Light continually chases away darkness. It's the nature of light. And if we're going to talk about the good news being the best news that's ever come into the world in the person of Jesus that reflects truth, justice, uh, mercy, and peace, that necessarily has to say something to the way that we've historically mistreated each other or the prejudices that live within our hearts. How can it not? So when people say to me, hey, you can talk about this race stuff, but, ooh, but be very careful that you don't let that sneak into our gospel conversations. They're talking about a gospel that they have packaged, manipulated, reduced down, redacted, and then put into some kind of a vault that makes it completely disconnected from reality. Does that make sense? So they take the light and they, they do like a campfire where, where you got the little burner and you grab that little metal kind of shield and you wrap it around that light to focus it so you can cook. Well, that's great for, for focusing that light and then giving you something you want, but we're not supposed to, to guard or shield or, or use the gospel for our own purposes. The gospel is a wild, crazy revolutionary, uncontrollable reality that, that people have been liberated and set free. If I walk to a country where people have been set free from a dictatorial regime, pick a country. I don't know. Um, 
but there's country X and people have lived under oppression for a long time and now that oppression is lifted and freedom has come and, and I imagine now the country is going crazy and they're celebrating and they're eating and they're drinking and they're running through the streets and imagine me uh, running up to somebody and saying you're not talking about the good news correctly you're not, you're, you're not explaining it right how crazy would that sound? What do, you, what do you mean? I've been set free. I don't care what language I use to talk about it. If, if I understand what liberation is, and I'm giving voice to that, then somehow there's a truth in my words that rings to anyone who's going to listen, unless you're somehow disconnected from the story of what's going on. And then you're trying to make the story fit the way you want it to sound, but you're not actually in the rhythm of that double dutch or that jump rope or whatever else it is, right? If you're in the rhythm of liberation happening, you're not going to try and over control the words. It is a light and that light shines and it says something true. And the people who most need that liberation are going to understand that it's good news. Does that make sense? That if, if you really like tight theological um, things, then you might, you might be feeling a tension right now. And I think it's the same thing that religious people have always felt. I used to feel it. Um, the religious leaders in Jesus' day felt it. Jesus, the way you're talking, it's, it just feels a little uncontrollable. It feels a little unsafe. The uneducated people are going to take it and run with it, and we don't know what they're going to do with it. Like, you got to use the, the appropriate language that's a part of version 21.1234 that we approved at our council as the appropriate language to use about explaining it. Like, it, it's going to be, um, you see what I'm saying? And here, uh, I'm going to just, because I don't like saying the same thing twice every time, I'm going to throw in a wrinkle that I didn't do in the first service, so this, this, this is free. Um, they didn't get it, so, you, so, you, so they didn't get that, just so you can feel. Um, here's the biggest problem I, I see with the gospel is we've made an idol out of a part of it. This, this is, um, an idol is when you take something uh, and you begin to see it disconnected from God and ascribing to it more meaning than, than how God ascribed to that. Okay, now this is going to sound really, really controversial. Um, the problem with our gospel is that, that, it, that we've made it a cross-only gospel. Give me a second here because I'm going to prove to you I'm not liberal. Um, but our problem is that we've made it a cross-only gospel. Why is that a problem? You guys are about to celebrate Easter. Why is that a problem? If it's a cross-only gospel, why is that a problem? It's not that the cross isn't a part of the gospel. I'm saying if you make it a cross-only gospel, why is that a problem? But, yeah, if all you have is Good Friday, then you don't have Easter Sunday. And in, uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, if you don't have the res, if, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead bodily, then we're fools. We're idiots. This thing has no power, and nobody should really follow it. Like, like he took great pains to say that you don't have the good news or, or the whole gospel if you don't have Easter. And so what's happened in our church is, is over time, and it really, if we were to go back and explain it, it was the battle between uh, the Reformation and the Catholics. And you, when you battle, you don't talk about what you agree on, you talk about what you disagree on. And so in this battle, it really had to do with the cross. And so the conversation got reduced down here. And the interesting thing is, the cross has always been the means of our salvation. It's the means. And, and in focusing on it so much, we forgot that there's an end to our salvation. In fact, we also forgot that there's a motive to our salvation. So now let me try and recontextualize the gospel just for a second. It starts with the motive, love. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. And that son dies for the sins of the world. Atonement, which has a necessary horizontal component. We just talked about that. But that's the means. On the cross, Jesus, the, the lamb, 
was slain. Just like in the temple court, you had an altar and they would bring lambs at the Passover and lambs would be slain and the blood of those lambs would cover sins, atone for sins, so that we could come closer as unholy, unclean people, closer to a holy or clean God. And that God was residing as a spirit in the temple building, which was the temple and then, or the holy place, and then the most holy place. And so in the temple, there was a, a veil, roughly four to five inches thick veil that separated where God's spirit, Holy Spirit dwelt from people. And only one person, the high priest on pain of death, could enter that every year. And so we come as sinful people. The blood of the lamb cleans us so that we can come closer to God, which is, which is true north for our soul. And when Jesus died on the cross, the cross pictured the altar, did it not? And he is the lamb, picturing the lamb, was on that cross. His blood uh, shed for us, cleanses us, but once and for all this time, so that we can come closer to God. Now, if the cross was the only part of the good news, when Jesus died on the cross at the temple mound, the altar should have cracked in half because never again would there need to be another sacrifice. True? True? In fact, that's what C.S. Lewis wrote in, in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, right? The table on which Aslan was, was killed, when he uh, came back, that got cracked because never would it be needed again. So if I'm really trying to play with people, I, I actually pretend that that's what happened, and, and I say, is that true? And everyone goes, yeah. And I'm like, no, it's false, actually. If you were standing next to the altar and you were just waiting to Instagram, make a story out of like the altar cracking, like you you wouldn't have had a story because nothing happened there. What did happen? The temple veil ripped from top to bottom, symbolizing that God himself is the agent of our salvation, was now ripping the barrier between, between us and him. So the motive of the good news is God's love for us. The means of our salvation is Jesus' death on a cross that forgive, forgives us. And the purpose or the end of, of the gospel is reconciliation with God. So the problem is we've, we've gotten so fixated on atonement, God's wrath poured out on Jesus and landed there. It's why we have 25% of the world's inmates in prison in the United States with only 5% of the world's population. I'm convinced this is a part of it because we're so focused on the part of the story that's God's wrath for sin. And that sin is a big deal and the people that do it need to be punished. We don't understand the motive of love and the purpose of reconciliation. You steal a car, let's have a society where you pay back for that car and might even come back into a relationship with the person that you stole the car from and that there's reconciliation. Instead, your life gets put away for 10 years. I don't understand how the two connect. The Old Testament talks about reconciliation. The heart of God, mercy, peace, truth, justice, is about reconciliation, that when we break relationship, somehow that relationship needs to be fixed, right? So I'm saying the whole gospel is John 3.16 and the cross, Good Friday, and Easter Sunday, and I'll give you even more, and Jesus' promise that he's going to give us the Holy Spirit, and his ascension into heaven, and then his giving of the Holy Spirit so that we as the body of Christ are animated, that the Holy Spirit comes in and makes us alive to continue the ministry of Jesus, which was a ministry of reconciling things back to the way they ought to be. It's a jubilee ministry. So let's show Corinthians here. We'll just jump. This is a telling of the gospel or Colossians. I might have, uh, we got the second Corinthians verse. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. Great hallmark verse of baptism, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And it continues and says, what God, uh, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and ultimately has committed to us now this message of reconciliation. So we see God's initiative 
to bring things back, that it comes through Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and extends now to us, not just as the recipients of grace, not just as the hearers of grace, but as the agents of grace in this world. Um, Why does race belong in the church conversation? Because we are fundamentally agents of reconciliation. So when you have race, that's actually my phone. Um, It's embarrassing. When you actually have something like race going on in America, which is a reconciliation problem, and, and we go try and live out our ministry of reconciliation somewhere else, there's something kind of funky about that. Like there's an elephant in the room, and your job is to, to be about elephants, and yet you're ignoring that to go deal with the mice. Um, all right, I, I'm going to now have to go a lot faster. because um, So it's a part of the gospel. Um, we, we need to know our racial history. We need to know where we came from. Um, the Bible uh, and the prophets, the whole of God's people as a people of the book, we're always supposed to be looking back and learning from the story of Israel. The, the past is supposed to inform what we did right in the past and what we did wrong in the past is supposed to inform our faith. Um, so we have a national past. And it, and it continues beyond slavery. It continues into the 1900s, and the legacy of it really shapes our landscape even today. So a quick example would be of redlining. This is a picture of redlining in Chicago. Um, briefly, we had a Great Depression. During the Great Depression, if the bank owned your home or owned a loan on you, at any moment they could ask you for, for the whole amount, and if you couldn't give them the whole of what you owed, they could take all your property. So when the dominoes really started falling during the Great Depression and the run on banks, it just turned into a tidal wave. So when um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt came in, they created something called the, the Federal Housing Administration, FHA, and they created what we know as the 30-year fixed mortgage loan. Now, if you can pay your monthly payment, the bank can never come and just take your house from you. All you have to do is be able to sustain your monthly payment and you're protected. So we're not going to go back into a Great Depression like that. So um, I'm buying a house right now. I've got a mortgage broker and he's asking me all sorts of questions because the, the federal government has all these regulations to make sure they don't give me a bad loan a loan I can't repay, because then that would all go on to the federal government, right? It's a protection mechanism. But as part of this protection mechanism, what they did is they went and evaluated all the cities in America to rate how safe the loans would be in those neighborhoods. And they ranked them green all the way on down to red. And a green uh, area was an area that could just get a loan, no problem, whatever. A red area was basically a black bald area, meaning that this is not a safe place to give a loan. And so the FHA wouldn't back loans in those areas. Now, one of the criteria of deciding what a red, it's called redlining, by the way, in history. One of the areas, uh, the criteria that determined whether an area would be redlined is whether there was the presence of immigrants or people of color in those neighborhoods. Because if there were, it would, it, it, it portended, it foreshadowed the economic instability of that neighborhood because the people that were more secure, the white people, were going to eventually move out and this was going to be a high risk area. And so, uh, you didn't get loans backed into this. By the way, this went all the way into the, the 60s um, in different forms. And, and so the people in these areas had no choice because they couldn't move into the other areas. Why? Because those neighborhoods precluded people of color or immigrants coming in. In fact, in most states, it was in the ethics codes of real estate agents that they were not allowed to sell to an immigrant or a person of color into a white neighborhood. Um, and CCNRs in those neighborhoods and, and everything else. So you have to buy in this area. You can't get a 30-year loan. You end up having to buy from a loan shark at high interest rates, which keeps you in poverty, right? Um, and so you end up getting a racial map of our cities. This is Chicago, by the way. 
And this is back then. And today you see that it still very much looks just like this with south side of Chicago being a historic area where, where people that weren't able to get loans ended up living and then future generations because they also don't have the, uh, the generational wealth that comes from home, home ownership to be able to go and, and get the mortgages that require a 20% down payment. Um, this has shaped our map. If you under, ever wonder why are the cities the way they are with regard to segre segregation, our state-sponsored racist policies that took into account people's color of their skin shaped the demographics of our city today and had a significant impact on the generational wealth of different communities, again, based simply on the color of their skin. And so we are, are still living with the legacy of that. And if we don't understand this, then just like that article I talked about at the table, we're not going to talk about any of these issues regarding equity or wealth or, or very troubled communities and the issues they're facing with bad schools or everything else. But the person that's sitting at that table that has grown up with the knowledge of this is going, this is a relevant conversation and why are we avoiding it? Um, this is redlining. On the local level, Oregon was a state that had exclusionary laws, some of the worst exclusionary laws in the country. Um, there was actually a period of time for a year where if you were a black person in this state, you had to pay a tax. If you couldn't pay the tax, then you got whipped. As a free person, just because of the color of your skin, you were, you were given a tax, and if you couldn't pay the tax, you were whipped as a means of trying to deter you from staying in this state and taking jobs. Um, we, uh, in Bend, Oregon, where I just was, Bend was a sundowner town, meaning that if you were a person of color, you were told you weren't allowed to be in town after sundown. I have a Native American friend on the Warm Springs Reservation that still remembers going into Bend and seeing signs that said, no Indians or dogs allowed, right? Um, sundowner towns, these are the kinds of signs you would have seen in the 1900s. So when, when we talk about, boy, that's too political. I'll avoid it. Maybe I won't. Um, when we talk about making America great again, when you ask most people, what do you mean by make America great again? What, what point of American history are you looking to go back to? The number one answer is in the 50s. It should not be missed on us that the 50s was before the civil rights legislation, that there were still lynchings in the South, and that this is the time of segregation in the South, that, that the time when these signs were still allowed by our federal government and upheld by the police that were a part of our federal government apparatus in the South and in different places. So there's an there's a interesting tension about understanding the complexity of our history and that when we point back to a certain time, we have to understand what are the implications of saying that that time was a great time in history. These are the kinds of signs that you would have seen. Um, you would even see a, a picture of a church that looked like this. Um, Anyone ever seen that picture? So would it surprise you if I told you what town that church was in? Portland, Oregon. That's Portland, Oregon. Why do we have to talk about these things? Because our demographics aren't accidental. They were shaped by people and policies that made Bend a 92% white town. It wasn't a white town originally. <laughs> there were Native American like tribes that, that, that had, you know, were on those lands first. It's a white town because it was shaped to be a white town. Oregon, for a decade, had the highest per capita Ku Klux Klan membership of any state in the Union. Did you know that? So we have to begin to go, it's not like race is someone else's issue, but, you know, I'm not racist. My family wasn't racist. Our church does great. It's like, no, the broader context in which I live has some significant things that speak to this, and I have to begin to own that into my kind of conversation with my neighbor. Um, here's another picture from Portland, Oregon. It's uh, of an immigrant that while he was at work, the, the tenants in his apartment complex broke into his house and left this message for him. Um, in fact, there's more that we could talk about with regard to Oregon and our history of, of engaging people that are different from us. Um, but it goes on everywhere. Alabama, 
uh, in addition to talking about how to give a good education to kids in schools or, or make sure that they were working on the economy, um, made sure they took time out to, to protect and make sure that Confederate statues would always exist in a state that has a, a really large African American population that view those Confederate statues very differently. In fact, this same state um, in the 2000s went to the ballot because on their state constitution, the segregation rhetoric is still in there. In other words, their state constitution mandates segregation. And so in, in the 2000s, they went to the polls to remove that, to kind of cleanse their state constitution. Um, anyone want to guess what happened in that election? It was upheld to leave it in by 54% margin. Now, to make matters worse than that is that a number of years later, in the 2010s, um, they brought the referendum again and that the percentage went up of the people voting to keep it in. Um, by the way, the South, Alabama, is the most Christian part of our country. Um, our church history has been shaped, our theology has been shaped by a desire to try and compartmentalize off the awkward parts where we're failing to deal equitably with others and preserve the super spiritual individualistic parts so that I can feel like I'm still walking rightly or righteously with God without, without having these two things talk to each other. And that's why when you talk about justice, certainly in the 90s when I, I got going in seminary and got going in church, if you brought up issues of love or justice, people would immediately want to shut it down and go, that's a slippery slope. Talking about society, that's a slippery slope away from God. <laughs> and, and the book of John, um, 1 John, if you say you love God but don't love um, your brother who you can see, then, then you do not love God. Because how can you not love someone that you can see and say that you love someone that you can't see? Um, these two things are fundamentally connected. American evangelicalism, I'm talking our 200-year history, has purposely tried to create this false dichotomy so that we could al allow ourselves to live without the ongoing tension of, of this dysfunction or this injustice that, that I think deep down inside we know that God would not be okay with. Um, in two minutes, I'm going to just give you the last things if you're a note taker. Um, so it's part of our gospel. We need to talk about race. It's a part of our, our shared story, so we need to talk about it. It's a part of our, our tradition that we're, corp we're a corporate entity. And so doing the whole thing like, I didn't do it, I'm not complicit, you know, I'm not the racist, is actually not a biblical tradition. Uh, in Daniel, we see Daniel, he was too young, age of accountability, to be guilty for the sin of Israel when they were carted off into exile. Yet when we see Daniel praying in the book of Daniel, he prays like this, we have sinned against you, God. Forgive us for our iniquity. We deserved what you gave us. We, re we repent of that. There's this beautiful picture of the maturity of Daniel that says, I don't have to excuse myself from this injustice. I live in the middle of it. Like, let me just lament that and own it. God, forgive me for the racial history of America, for the number of people we've abused, for the lynchings that have happened on Friday night with all the people that were there sitting at pews at a Baptist church on Sunday morning, that those are the people that I, I share a faith with. Forgive me. Forgive me for the way I view people or what I think about when I'm walking on one side of the street and people walk down the other side of the street and ideas pop into my mind and I don't know where they came from but they're definitely my ideas and I could blame society or my parents or whatever or TV for shaping me that way but that's still in me God it's messy forgive me cleanse me I don't want to be like that let us be different let us be a light let us be good news let us be agents of grace let me not live into that past history we have to know that history first before we can confess it and try and recover from it the, the fourth thing, change only happens when the issue is pushed. The South never got better with regard to race except by being pushed. 600,000 people died so that slavery would end. The civil rights uh, movement, segregation only ended when the, when the federal government sent in troops and forced it. 
Confederate monuments aren't going to come down unless the national pressure is, hey, we know these are kind of icons and heroes and people grow up and, and you kind of like these cultural things. But when we share a faith with brothers and sisters of color who look at that and go, that was a slaveholding person. And to have my child grow up in this city with them in the center of the city square is deeply, deeply troubling. And I have a grandfather or a great uncle that was lynched in the South by the legacy of these people that carried forward. Ku Klux Klan, started by Nathan Bedford Forrest, the, the Calvary general. That, that some of the schools that were leading the way in thinking of the, the ideology that gave rise to segregation were being presidented or taught at by the Confederate generals. It's deeply troubling. And so even if we love that kind of folklore and tradition, we have to at least empathize with the way other people see it. And so nothing has changed unless there's a push. The, the prophets pushed. Jesus pushed. Truth pushes us. We like to think that the thing we lack in terms of knowledge is the gap in our knowledge. You know, I don't know much about golf or I don't know much about basket weaving. Like, I'm deficient there. I, I need information and then I would be more knowledgeable. The greatest form of knowledge is when bad ideas are rooted out and, and then somehow transformed or redeemed. Brothers and sisters, all of us in this room, it's the bad thinking or the, the thinking that's a little bit off that is the most dangerous to our, our knowledge of truth or our ability to live into truth. And so we have to be pushed in on and, and feel the tension of our, our ideas being challenged that we might evaluate them and hold them up and say, God, um, help me weed out the things that are not going to make me live out the life of Jesus in me. And then right off of that is just simply this, that bad data has to be replaced, which means that we have to value ongoing adult education. Bad data has to be replaced. Being a disciple just simply means you're a learner. It's a Greek word. Disciple equals learner. Plato had disciples. Aristotle had disciples. And Jesus, as a rabbi, a, a grad school professor of his day, had these learners that followed him, and he taught them. He was a teacher. He went by that name, rabbi. And so we have to be willing to learn and have bad data be replaced by good data. My, my father-in-law, he, uh, he grew up being taught that jello salad was the same thing as salad. Um, and it's not, actually. And some bad ideas have to be replaced. We used to live with this idea that colorblind was some kind of a virtue. God didn't make us like dogs with black and white vision. God made us with the ability to see color. Um, and... When we, a good friend of mine wrote a book and she argues as an Asian woman that when we don't see color, it's like someone that was, was sexually abused or traumatized as a child. It's like saying to them, I'm uncomfortable with that. I don't know what to say about that. I don't, I don't even know how to understand that. It'd be a lot more comfortable for me if we set your abuse aside and then we just had a really good friendship with the rest of you. And she said, when you tell me that you're colorblind, what you're basically saying is, I'm uncomfortable with your color. I don't know how to interact with your color. So I, it'd just be a lot easier for me if we took your, your color, your racial identity, and all the history and trauma that came with that, and just set that aside. And let's just center our relationship on good movies and, and going to the mall and having cheeseburgers. You know, It's not actually dignifying. God made us in different colors. He created the diversity. And what God created as good is a beautiful thing for us. And so here's the, the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation says this is where we're heading to. We're heading to um, looking and before us there's this great multitude and, and no one can count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which means it's multicultural, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And they were wearing white robes and holding palm branches, and they cried out in a loud, loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God. He's the author and the agent of our salvation. And he sits on the throne, and glory to the Lamb as well. Our greatest joy is going to be 
be joining with brothers and sisters of different cultures and colors and ethnicities and, and worshiping our God together in a beautiful chorus of voices. And so here's the, the great opportunity. We can push race aside because it's easier or more comfortable, or we can lean into that messy thing, accept our responsibility and say, God, I'm a part of this whole wicked thing and I want to grow, I want to learn. Because the more that we can experience diversity now, it's a little bit of heaven on earth. If that's heaven, the greater diversity we have in our, in our church expressions now, the, the greater joy we have getting a taste of heaven now. And so let's, brothers and sisters, not avoid the difficult conversations, certainly not in today's climate, certainly not as people that are confident that we have the truth, that even when we get it wrong, we have a gracious God that steers us and corrects us and leads us ever on. Jesus was never afraid of our questions. He was never af afraid of our learning posture. Um, and so let's be open enough, vulnerable enough to walk forward, knowing that God will, will guide us, the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. Let's pray. Father, um, we, we are blessed to be called sons and daughters of the Most High. And grace is something that transforms. Grace begets grace. Love begets love. Let us be so in touch with and overwhelmed by the motive of the gospel, the means of the gospel, and also the ends of the gospel, the good news that is wild, that is crazy, that it will fuel us to love others. We love because you first loved us. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. So good. I want to invite you guys to stand. Um, invite you to come to the table this morning um, to partake of the reconciling work of Jesus, his body broken for us, his blood shed for us, that we would have life. Let's worship together. Be thou my being.